tell you what, I, I feel like I could have just sat with all of you and let the worship team just keep going. Uh, there are those moments when you just feel like you're in the throne room a little bit, so thank you for that. Yes. But we have a sermon to preach, so prepare yourselves. Uh, sometimes God just breaks through in the lyrics of a song and speaks to my heart. I don't know if you had that experience as well a moment ago when we were singing that, that, that line, have you, have, have you not seen how all your desires have been granted in what he ordains? Have you not seen all that God has provided and given to you? I feel like God was speaking to me. Have you not seen, Jeff, that I, I, that I have it under control, that I'm providing for all that you need? Maybe you're like me and you forget sometimes. And it's good. Even as we sing it, I'm singing praise to God, but almost my own reminder, you know, that I need sometimes. That's what happens in worship when we do that. Let's bow once more and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we come here, uh, some of us busy, some distracted, some ready for worship, but you are speaking. You've been speaking to us as we sing our hearts out to you. And you've told us that your word is living and active. And you, Lord Jesus, said, those who have ears, let them hear. So give us ears to hear what you would say to us through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, many years ago, you heard uh, Kim mention a moment ago, uh, Shepherd's Heart. And we're serving more people in need in Shepherd's Heart than ever before. Which, you know, with, with some of the economic challenges and what's happening in our culture, that's not all that shocking. But your contributions, your generosity toward the church, the Shepherd's Heart, are making a difference in the lives of many, many people in our region. Years ago, a man came to our church before we ever had Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry. We just had a little closet with some canned goods, and we would occasionally give out some financial help. This is, this is over 15 years ago. He was looking for help. He was in a desperate situation. You could just see it on his face. He was desperate. He, he looked and smelled like he'd been sleeping in his car, and he was with his girlfriend. And he was, he'd heard from others that our church might be able to help him. It was on a Friday afternoon, and most of the staff was out. I happened to be there, which is not that, not that usual, but I was. And so I knew where we kept a, a drawer full of uh, cards to mire. On occasion, people would come and drop off gift cards, $25 gift cards to Meyer, to be given out to people in need. And so I knew where they were, and we had four left. And so I just gave them all four, which was against protocol. <laughs> but that's what happens when I'm in charge. Right? <laughs> right. And he was uh, stunned by this. He was looking for some help just to fill up his gas tank. He and his girlfriend were sleeping in their car. He was really in a desperate situation. I gave him those four gift cards. I prayed with him. And um, sent him on his way. Never saw him again. But five years later, I got a, a letter in the mail, an envelope, a large envelope, vanilla envelope in the mail, addressed to me in, the ch in our church. And I opened it up, and there was a letter inside, a note inside, and inside was, a, it was kind of thick, uh, were, were individual envelopes, like little small ones. And each of those envelopes were 10 $25 gift cards rubber banded together, and there were five such envelopes inside there to Meyer. And it was a note from that individual. He said five years later, he married his girlfriend. He was in a little church, living in a different state, working construction. God had done remarkable things in his life. They had two children. And he said, not a day goes by that I don't think about that day. Because you didn't know this, but I was on the verge of giving up on my relationship with my girlfriend, on faith in God, and on life. He told me when I met him that day that he would repay it someday, and people say that. Okay, you don't have to. And he said that that moment marked him. It was, he had been, just been praying that God give us a sign if you're really with us, if you're really present, do something, because we're desperate. I had no idea. I just got to be the sign. Quite frankly, if I remember vaguely back to that day, I was in a hurry to get home, so I gave him what we had prayed with him and went on my way. Here's the point of that little story. You, you don't know, you just don't know what a single act of kindness or generosity will do in someone's life. You don't know the story. You don't know what's going on. And I shudder, quite frankly, because sometimes I think, how many of those have I missed? Because I'm in a hurry. Praise God that I was present for that one, but how many do we just rush right by? We don't see with God's eyes. God used that moment to redirect that man's life, the life of his wife, his children, hopefully their children. It really is amazing to think about. 
So today in our series on the way, we've been examining the way of Jesus. The the early Christians are called people of the way. They lived in a particular way which stood out in the first century world. We've been looking at, well, what is the way? What are the marks, the characteristics, the distinguishing marks of, of those who follow the way of Jesus? We're looking at the way of generosity. I'm sure some of you hear that right now, or maybe you looked online, you saw what the topic was, and you're thinking, oh, it's the giving sermon, right? Well, yes, it is, and afterwards, nobody can leave till you, no, just kidding. <laughs> Not at all, there's no, I, I hope, put that aside, if you've got that, if you grew up in a church where you were guilted about giving, where it's this hang up, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, as Kim mentioned a moment ago, that generosity lies at the heart of everything good God has done and is doing in the world today. Through his son Jesus, through his spirit, and through his people. Years ago, we did a series called Generosity, and we defined it as freedom from smallness of heart. I love that definition. Generosity is freedom from self-focused small-heartedness. So this is really not a sermon about money, not primarily anyway, or about giving. It's talking about where does it come from? What motivates this? How is it a mark of the early church? How should it be a mark of the church today? So Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now, a number of weeks ago, we looked at Acts chapter 2, sort of the the most famous description of the early church, Acts 2, 42 to 47. We're going to look at another similar snapshot of the very first followers of the way. Read it together. Now, the full number of those who believed, that's the, the church, were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. This is such an amazing description. It's like you get a little snapshot of what, were the, what was the heart like? What was the character and the soul of the first church like? Do you ever stop to think when you read, these, when you read the book of Acts, particularly the first few chapters, you're reading about your spiritual ancestors. Maybe some of you uh, have old photo albums or scrapbooks from your history. My dad's dad... It's part of our Scottish heritage. Don't forget where you come from, lad, and don't forget where you're going. Right? <laughs> Fraser is a clan name, you know, so we're proud of it. The Fraser family clan, his motto is, all my hope is in God. Isn't that good? Anyway, maybe you think about your own family name, your own heritage. Spiritually speaking, when we read the book of Acts, that's our, as the family of God, as the church in the world, that's a story of our heritage. That's a story of our lineage. It's where we come from. So here's a question. How does the way of Jesus impact the way you view and use your wealth? I want you to keep that question in mind as we go throughout this morning. How does the way of Jesus impact the way you view money and use money? Because it should. Like if if following Jesus is going to impact every area of our life, then that's got to include our stuff. Most of, most of us would prefer if we said, okay, I'll follow Jesus, but I'd like to keep this over here, right? You could have access to everything else, but not this. So to understand what's being described in Acts 4, 32 to 35, we need to go back a little bit and talk about what's happening in this whole chapter. So just to give you the background, at the beginning of chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested by the Sanhedrin. Now, if you don't know much about the New Testament, that's okay. The Sanhedrin is a Jewish high council. Think like religious supreme court uh, and legislative body in Jerusalem and and in Israel. So they're, they're both the religious and civil leaders of Israel under Rome's authority. They're the ones who strong arm Pontius Pilate into crucifying Jesus. They have a lot of power. So there, Peter and John are arrested by the Sanhedrin for preaching in the name of Jesus. Hey, we killed that guy. Stop talking about him, essentially is what they said. 
They warned them. They beat them severely and threatened them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. The middle of the chapter, uh, chapter 4, is about how the church, the first believers, respond to this threat. Peter and John come back, excited that they were beaten and threatened, which is a little strange, at least to us. They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Would you do that? And then the church, you know how they respond? They organize a public protest. No. No. They, they, they march on the Capitol. Nope. What do they do? Can you guess? They pray. They worship God and they pray. Let's look at a couple passages from the middle of chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders said to them. That's the Sanhedrin, by the way. And when they heard that, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now we'll skip down to verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Keep that screen right there. Notice at the end of the prayer, the place where they were was shaken. Notice also, what do they pray for? Do they pray for safety? Do they pray for protection? Do they pray for a change in their circumstances? No. I, I gotta be honest, that's what I would pray for. Lord, protect us. Lord, keep, help, keep us safe. Lord, help this oppression to go away. And there's nothing wrong with praying that. It's just curious and instructive to me. That's not the heart of their prayer. Their prayer is, their prayer is Lord, give us a n- more opportunity to share more boldly about who you are. Whoa. And after their prayer, the place was shaken. The, the, the word shaken literally means it's a trembling that happens. And this is common in the, in the scriptures. When you read about the presence of God at Mount Sinai, the very mountain shakes. When God's presence comes down, things shake. And this shouldn't be that surprising. When anything of greater weight or significance comes down, there's a shaking if it comes down on those of lesser significance. As a silly example, as a man of more than average girth, I have sometimes come down on chairs that were not ready for the full weight of my glory, if you know, if you know what I mean. And they shake, sometimes break. I remember years ago being at a graduation party when I was a high school pastor for a senior girl. I was at the party on her deck, you know, we're talking to families and parents and hey, congratulations. And I sat down on this like plastic Adirondack chair <laughs> just on my back. <laughs> hey, how are you? Lay on my back, looking up at this family. You know? so, so when God's presence comes down, the scripture says the mountains shake. The room shakes. And, but you notice something that says, a couple of, a couple of lines here, just to, just to point out here. It says that when God's presence comes down, the place was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But weren't, wasn't God's presence already there? I mean, isn't that the teaching of the Bible? God is omnipresent. Isn't he always everywhere present? What's different about this presence? And weren't they already filled with the Holy Spirit? I mean, didn't the Spirit come at Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost and descend on the first believers? So what, why, what's happening here? What, what it's, it's saying is this. What they already knew and the presence of God, and what they already had, the presence of the Spirit in their their lives, they were experiencing in a way they hadn't before. It doesn't mean that God was absent before, or they did not have his Spirit. It means the presence of God, which was always there, and the Spirit of God residing in their hearts, became real to them in a way that shook them. They trembled because of it. Has that happened to you? Intellectually believing that God is real and good and powerful. 
Believing because the scripture says so that it's spirits in your heart and then having an experience in a moment of worship, in a moment of solitude by yourselves, in a moment with your family, in a moment of reading his word, some moment where you feel shaken by the reality of those things which you intellectually believed before. That's what's happening here. It is one thing to believe that God is powerful. Go to the next one there. It's another thing to experience his power. It's one thing to believe that God is good. It's another thing, as the psalmist says in Psalm 34, to taste and see that he's good, to taste his goodness. An illustration of this is in the first century of Palestine, they did not have sugar. Sugar is in India and China. But they, didn't have, they, didn't, they knew sweetness. They knew about honey and, and, and natural sweeteners. They didn't have sugar. Imagine somebody travels from first century Palestine to the Far East and tastes sugar, pure sugar for the first time. Comes back and tries to describe it. And you believe that person, yeah, sugar is sweet, I believe you. I kind of know what sweetness is. But it's not the same until you what? Taste it yourself. Whoa! Right? Like my wife's chocolate chip cookies. I can tell you how good they are. They are amazing. They're not like anything you've ever had. I'm like, okay, I believe you, Pastor Jeff, but until you taste one. Your life's not changed. <laughs> They're tasting something. They're seeing something. There's a place in Romans chapter 8 where the Apostle Paul talks about what this really means. In Romans 8 verse 16, he says that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. You're a son and daughter of, of the Most High God. You might know that intellectually, but you need to experience that in a profound way. And the Spirit of God testifies with your spirit that you are, which moves you from head to heart. Thomas Goodwin, a 17th century Puritan writer, in his commentary on this passage in Romans 8, has a profound uh, illustration. He said he's walking down the road one day and he sees ahead of him on the pathway a father and a young son walking together. And he's observing them. And he sees the father snatch up his little boy in his arms and hug him and kiss him. And he overhears the father say, I love you, son. And the little boy says, I love you too, father. And he puts him back down and they continue on their way. He said, it was, God spoke to him through that little observation, something out of ordinary life, that that's what the spirit does in us. Was the boy less a son when he was walking next to the father than when he was in his arms? No. Legally, circumstantially, positionally, he was the son the whole time. But what happened when, the, when daddy snatched him up, hugged him and kissed him? He's experiencing his sonship in a way he didn't before. I think what's happening in this description of the place where they were was shaken is they are experiencing the fact that they belong to the most high God in a powerful way, which changes them. Now, you, you can't live every moment of your life with the, with the, with the experience. There, there are churches who focus all on the experience. It's all about the experience, the emotional power of it. And there are other churches who are terrified of that, and they run from it, and it's all about the head and intellectual. I, I think we need a balance there. Because there's a whole lot of being a faithful Christian that means just obeying when it's mundane, when I don't feel it. But we also need to know, we need to feel that, to have that experience. And that's what's happening here. Why do I belabor that point? Because when God's presence becomes real to you, it changes things. Everything. It changes how you think about who you are, what relationships matter, and it changes how you think about your stuff. We see that in the text. Okay, let's look at three ways that the uh, first Christians were impacted and how they responded. First, the way of unity. The way of unity. Now, uh, in Acts 4.32, we see this passage here. Now, the full number of those who believed, this is, means just, that just means the church, were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of his, the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. We've talked about this before, but this word common is a single Greek word, which is called koinonia. And it means the, the commonness or the shared life together. 
It refers to their life in Christ, everything in common. Now, that doesn't mean, like, like their unity was not uniformity. It doesn't mean in the early church nobody ever disagreed about anything. That's clearly not true. Just read the New Testament. There's lots of corrections where they're getting things wrong and fighting and arguing. It doesn't mean that they didn't have differences, social differences, racial differences, economic differences, ideological differences. What it means is that what they shared in Christ held them together despite all the things that would otherwise pull them apart. And I've said this so many times in the last two and a half years, but I think this is the most important and critical thing lacking in the church today. We are pulled apart by things because we are not held together by what's most important, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see it all the time. One of the remarkable things about the early church is they, they had lots of reasons not to be held together, but their, common, their koinonia was in Christ, and that was more powerful than all the other things that the society says should divide you. The same thing's true in Acts 2, 44. We see the same thing. All the believers were together, and they had all things in common. There's that same word again. All things that matter. All things that hold them together in common. This is, by the way, when it says that they, none of them saw their own possessions as their own, it just, some have a, try to take this and say, well, this is the early church uh, teaching of the New Testament promotes socialism or communism. That's not what, <laughs> Luke's not saying that at all. They had stuff. None of them who had houses, so they had houses and possessions and wealth, but they didn't see them as mine for my own benefit for my own security and comfort. They, it, so in other words, the gospel of Jesus changed the way they saw their stuff. So, so communism says, or socialism says, what's yours is mine. The gospel says, what's mine is yours. There's a difference. Do you see it? They didn't view it as theirs. They viewed it as a gift of God's grace to be shared with the community. That's radical. Then and now. So the question for us, maybe, just as we pause, is how do you think about your stuff? How do you think about yours, what's yours? That you own it, that you earned it, you deserve it, you need it, you keep it because it's your security? Or all I have is a gift of the grace of God. Nothing is mine by right because I deserve it. And if God's given it to me, he's given it to me primarily for the, his glory and the good of others. I gotta be honest, I'm somewhere between those two. Probably you are as well. Grace changes the way you think about your wealth. Okay, next, the way of grace. At the center, whenever you read the Bible or read a passage of the Bible, I think it's a, a, we always do this as a preaching team. We meet every Thursday. We talk about this. I think a helpful thing to do is to read through the passage and ask the question, what's the center? What's the heart? What's the thrust of this text? And I think verse 33 is the thrust of the text. We'll look at it together. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So, two phrases here, great power and great grace. The word it, uh, for grace in Greek is the word megas, for great, excuse me, the word for grace is charis. And it, so literally, mega grace and mega power. Dunamis is the word for power in Greek, same root where we get our word dynamite from. Explosive power. Great grace was upon them all. Great power, mega power to witness about the resurrection of Jesus. And great grace, grace meaning the favor of God. Think about a great definition of grace I heard once was the smile of heaven. Grace is God's smile his favor bestowed on his people. In Numbers chapter six, the great priestly blessing that Aaron gives, let may God make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance toward you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. Like, a, like when you grab your child's face, moms and dads, 
you stare them in the face. Right? You want to squeeze them and kiss them, or grandma and grandpa. You're smiling on your beloved. That's, that's grace. Contrast that with if, if God were to turn his face away. It would be the end of us. So when you read great grace was upon them all, the smile of God was on them, and it was evident to people who don't even get what that is. They felt it, they saw it in them. Their generosity and compassion was the credibility for their witness in the world. So the message of grace they were proclaiming was embodied in the life of grace they were living. They matched up, in other words. It doesn't do any good to talk about the generosity of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and the, and you, but the life you're living is one of selfishness and me first. There's a disconnect there. We see in the early church that the, the message of grace they were proclaiming with their mouths was embodied in the, in the radical generosity and grace that they were living out in their community. The second century Roman satirist and philosopher Lucian of Samosata one of the fun things to do, uh, and this comes out of a quote, I got this from the book Bullies and Saints by John Dixon, uh, is, is uh, that he was a critic, he's critical of the, of the church, but also oddly attracted to it and compelled by the Christians. They were ridiculous to him and also compelling to him. Here's what he writes. Lucian of Samosata writes this. If we have that, I'm not sure if we do. The activity of these people in dealing with any matter that affects their community is something extraordinary. They spare no trouble, no expense. You see, these misguided creatures start with a general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion, which are so common among them. And then it was impressed upon them by their original lawgiver, that's Jesus, that they are all brothers and sisters from the moment they are converted. And they deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. All this they take quite on trust with the result that they, are, they, they despise all worldly goods alike, regarding them merely as common property. You hear what, what Lucius of Samosata in about 150 AD is saying? This doesn't make any sense. They actually think they're going to live forever because their lawgiver told them this. And they, they're radical about this. They, they reject their rights and their status and they don't even see their stuff as their own. Julian, Emperor Julian, there's letters to Julian in the, in, the, in the second century where he says, one of his aides says, these Christians put us to shame because they care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. It's one of the reasons they're growing so much is people see their generosity in action. I, I think this, we ought to reflect on this. There was in the first century something strange and strangely attractive about the Christians. I've just been thinking about that in my life. Is there anything strange and strangely attractive about us in the world? Maybe strange. You're all a little odd, right? Is there other things that are strange and strangely attractive about the way that we live? Or too often are we just like the rest of the world? Same fearfulness, same divisiveness, same bitterness. Same small-mindedness and small-heartedness. There ought to be something different, strange, and strangely attractive. I remember Aaron Wise was sitting over here told me a story once about a woman who came to Shepherd's Heart for help. This happens all the time, so this is not a unique story. Came for food because she heard that our church would give food. She wasn't a member, but she wasn't sure that we gave. Not only did she receive food, she received Financial help, she received budget counseling, she received all kinds of aid, but most importantly, she received friendship and prayer and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she said, this is what Aaron relayed to me, that I didn't know there were people like this. Does that mean that Christians are morally superior? Not at all. The question is, is there a mark of the great grace, the mega grace of Jesus evident in our lives? There should be. In the community of his followers. Last, the way of generosity. You knew we'd get there eventually, right? Remember the question, how does the way of Jesus impact the way you view and use your money? 
Well, we've talked about view. You, the, the first believers, because the grace of Jesus, didn't see their stuff as their own. They saw it as a gift from God to be used for his good in the world, to bless others. And therefore, they were radically generous. Look at verses 34 to 35 again. There was not a needy person among them. This phrase, needy person, is important. We'll talk about it in just a minute. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds that was sold and laid the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. The phrase needy person is a reference, which would be easy for us to miss, to Deuteronomy chapter 15. In Deuteronomy 15, if you know your Old Testament, uh, some of you will know this, that's the chapter where there's instructions about canceling of debts. That God's people in Israel, the season of the cancellation of debts and the blessing and care for the poor. Nobody be held down forever under a crushing load of debt. It's this vision God gives of his people that there would not be the desperation of poverty among the people of God. The hopelessness of of poverty. And so here we see in the church a fulfillment of that. An example, there was no needy. It doesn't mean there weren't rich and poor. There were. Because you see it right here in the text, right? Some had houses, some didn't. So there are rich and poor in the community. Together. Koinonia, being held together. The Christian community was a community of hope. And because of the great grace of Jesus, the hopelessness of poverty was slowly eliminated from within their community. In, our, in this room here, and those watching online, there are those who have a lot more than others. Now, on the world's economy, we're all in the 1% of the richest. But relatively speaking, there's a, there's a diversity even here. And in our church family, in our community, you heard a moment ago about Shepherd's Heart and all the needs. So it's not like we're gonna just level the playing field and make it all even. The point is, when the grace of Jesus becomes real to you, when you're shaken by it, you don't see your stuff as your own. You see it as belonging to him to be given to others for his glory. And in verse 35, we see there was a system of distribution. So it's not, it's not like uh, every individual believer just decides, I'm just going to give here, I'm going to give there. They bring it to the apostles, the leaders of the first church. And there's a system of distribution, there's an organization to this. There's a process. And quite frankly, if we were to read on in Acts chapter end of 4 and chapter 5, we see abuses of this. We see deception. We see corruption because from the beginning, we struggle with this. But the point is, the collective community brings their resources to the church, their community of faith, and says, we're, use this to bless others. That's at the heart of why we give. It honors God. It furthers the mission of the church. And it's good for our soul. This is not a ploy for you. We're not passing the plate today. <laughs> it's not a ploy for you to give more. But I would ask you this. If there's a part, but do you know that the New Testament teach, the Old Testament teaches a tithe? You know what a tithe means? The word means a tenth. So the baseline giving for the people of God in the Old Testament was to give 10% of their first fruits. In the New Testament, the, the tithe, the 10%, is not taught as a law. So you might be thinking, sweet, Whew, right? But let me ask you this Does the grace of Jesus, the mega grace of Jesus, Would that make us more generous or less generous than the law? You don't want to answer out loud, do you? More. Do you know that the average church-going American today gives less than 2%? It's not a guilt trip. I'm asking, this is between you and the Lord. So if, if, if that's an issue for you, maybe the question is not you should give more. But have you experienced the grace of Jesus such that you want to? Have you been shaken by his love and generosity to you to the point where you want to give more? That's that's really the question for me too. Can I be honest with you for a minute? We're we're almost out of time, but I'm gonna keep talking. 
Sometimes, as a pastor, my family is provided for by the generosity of God's people, many of you. So sometimes I, the little voice in my head is, well, why, if I give, I'm just like giving back what they gave. Like this rationalization, this justification. No, no, I should be the most generous with the resources God has given me. We all play the little game in our head, don't we? And the question is not guilt. What, what moves us to be generous is not guilt, but grace. That's what we see in this first church. Generosity is one of the key marks of people who have been changed by grace. I remember talking to a man years ago and I thanked him for a generous gift. I said, thank you for your generosity. And he said, I'm not that generous. I just have a lot of money. So you think I am. Because it's a big check. But actually, what's he saying? Right? There's... It's not the amount. It's what's happening in our hearts. I think most of us don't give generously. We're going to skip over 2 Corinthians 9. We don't have time for it. I think most of us don't give generously, not, not because we're misers or scrooges. I don't think most of you are sitting home at night like laying out your wealth on your bedspread going, oh, like my money. Right? You're, not thinking, you're not counting online like that. Like maybe you are. If that's, a, that's an issue, you should get help if that's you. Right? <laughs> I think most of us don't give generously because we're afraid. We're nervous about the future. We're fearful about not having enough, what will come. And there's no more freeing thing for fearfulness than the gospel. That's the whole point of this, I think, passage here. They've been set free by mega grace, shaken by it. So let me just draw a little, skip ahead a couple slides there. I know, we, I know I'm ahead of you. Go to the end, the last blank one there. I was just draw a little stair step here. Whoop. Yeah, good. And I think about this as a progression. We're, we're all in progress. I want you to place yourself somewhere on these stairs. For some of you in this room, giving is like, what? I'm barely making ends meet. And so for you, it's a first step to give at all. Take a step of investing in the work of God in his community. And it might be here at Chapel Street. That'd be wonderful. Maybe you have some other place that God's laid in your heart. But give outside of yourself. It's good for your soul. It honors God. And it makes a difference. Even if you think it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, but it makes a difference. And some of you, yeah, you do that on occasion. Christmas time when we make a big ask for, for, for a project or when it occurs to you or... But the next step for you would be to become consistent. To say, this is going to become a part of what I do and who I am. I'm going to consistently give away part of what God has given me for his work. Maybe that's your next step. Because you have given, and occasionally you do. And those of you, like some of you for years, this was me. I was consistent. But I, I, I wasn't proportional. I wasn't prayerfully and sacrificially thinking about what percentage of what God has given me Am I going to give back to him? And so it's proportional. Maybe this is your next step. To think, you know, I give consistently, but really it's not a... Uh, <laughs> proportional. You can, you can spell, even if I can't. I remember one time a man told me, my wife and I decided we are going to give 10% a year when we first got married, and we've increased, increased that 1% a year for the last 49 years. That's shocking. But every year, 1% of them, and I, not because he's bragging, but to say we're having the time of our lives giving away money for the good of the kingdom of God. And then for some of you, like you're committed to this, and the step is extravagant. We live in a wealthy community. We've been blessed in our church budget and when we make asks for projects to give away. I often say that our church is generous, and to a degree we are, but it's on a relative scale. I'm asking you, before the Lord, this week, to pray about this. Where are you? And maybe you're thinking, ah, I'm kind of good where I am. Pastor Jeff, thank you very much. We have pressures and financial pressures. I get that. And I'm in my own heart. 
The question I'm asking is, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm struggling to take the next step, it isn't guilt because God is angry if I don't. It's have I experienced his grace? Have I been shaken by his love and provision for me? Am I living with the constant awareness that I live solely based on the generosity of God? And if so, I want to be generous. Let's pray and we'll worship together. Father God, we pause and acknowledge that you are the giver of all good gifts, that the, the central reality of our faith is an act of your generosity, for you so loved the world that you gave your only son. And we have life in his name because of your generosity. We are here. We have life at all. We have hope for our future. Forgive us of our past because you are a generous God. Forgive us for being small-hearted and small-minded. Help us to reflect your generosity in the world. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Lord Jesus, you indeed are worthy of it all. From you and to you are all things, and you deserve the glory. You've given us everything. We give ourselves back to you. Brothers and sisters, go from this place in the mega grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you all things. To him be the glory. Amen. And go in peace.